You know the old saying, you never get a second chance to make a first impression? That phrase is incredibly true in our business. In entertainment, your first impression can mean everything. It can mean the difference of booking a job or not booking a job, having an audition or not having an audition. That first impression can get you in the door and make things happen. And for an actor, that first impression is the headshot. First and foremost, casting directors, producers, they're going to see your headshot and they're going to make decisions about whether or not you get seen based on that one image. So it's incredibly important to make that image an investment in your future. And to do that, you want to find the right photographer, someone who's going to work with you to craft the perfect image, the perfect first impression. And I suggest you check out portraitsbypeggy.com. Peggy's been doing photography since the 80s, and she really knows her stuff. And she wants to work with you to craft the perfect captured image, the one that captures the uniqueness of you and helps you book the job. She wants to work with you. She wants to really get into who you are, what sort of jobs you're trying to book, and help you get the perfect image. So check out PortraitsByPeggy.com and book your portfolio session today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Dawson. This is episode number 197 with EJ De La Pena. It's uh, Comic-Con week here in San Diego, and uh, we're all getting super jazzed and super psyched up and ready to go. Uh, Cosplay costumes have been put together, lightsabers have been acquired, and uh, incredible looking dresses from Westworld have been sewn and custom made. Uh, Yeah, so we're like in the thick of it, man. Comic-Con starts Wednesday night with preview night and runs all the way through Sunday, and a whole bunch of intellectuals are going to be making their way down to San Diego um, from all over San Diego County, and um, we'll be covering it on our YouTube channel and probably on Facebook Live and, you know, pretty much everywhere that you can find intellectual entertainment uh, content. So be sure to check out the website, theintellectual.com. Uh, you can also get there through the much easier address of ixe.us. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash intellectual network. And uh, you can follow us on Facebook. We are facebook.com slash intellectual entertainment. Uh, you can find us on Twitter as well. It's at the intellectual. Uh, we're on Instagram, also at the intellectual. And uh, we hope that you check out everything that we're going to be bringing you over the next four or five days from Comic-Con. It's going to be absolute insanity, and we will do our best to just give you uh, some of the highlights so you know what's coming in the world of geek culture, which these days is mainstream culture, film, television, uh, podcasts, radio, books. It's not just comic books anymore. Um, Anyway, um... For this episode, leading us into the wonderful world of Comic-Con, we sat down and uh, Whitney and I chatted with EJ De La Pena, who will be at Comic-Con promoting his new series, uh, Nobility, which you can find on Amazon Prime, and uh, it stars a whole slew of uh, names you'll recognize from sci-fi franchises like uh, Battlestar Galactica and... Stargate and Star Trek, and um, it's a it's a fiercely independent, um, real bootstrap operation, and I'm inspired by uh, by the grit and the tenacity of EJ to get this thing done and get it made. And um, we had a really good chat with him. And you know, he started out as a young child actor. He was in Jingle All the Way with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And um, we talk a bit about his experiences as a child actor, uh, all the way up to uh, making nobility, and it's uh, it's quite a journey for the young man. And uh, we bring it to you here on the intellectual. Uh, so, without any further ado, I'm gonna get this podcast put together so I can go to bed because I'm barely gonna sleep for the next like five days. <laughs> here it is, episode 197. With EJ De La Pena. 
Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The intellectual podcast starts now. Thank you for thank you for chatting with us. Um, I know it's busy time getting ready for Comic Con. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, uh, hey, no, uh, glad to be here. Glad to be talking with you guys. You've been to Comic Con before, Thanks for right? Having me. Sorry, what was that? You've been to Comic Con before, right? Oh yeah. About ooh. I don't know, seven, eight times, something like that. That's a lot. Since about yeah. 2012. So that's, I guess five, six times. That's awesome. It feels like seven or eight times. This will be my <laughs> first year attending. Oh, congratulations. You are going to be overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That is like the first thing anybody tells her. <laughs> Prepare to be overwhelmed. I'm not surprised. It is. It's sensory overload. <laughs> And it just gets bigger every year. I'm, I'm pretty sure that convention center is going to just like explode from all the people in it. Yeah, well, they're pushing real hard to try and expand it again. Um, I, I think that convention center exists 90% just because of Comic-Con. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, but if they expand it, that means they're going to have to have it uh, somewhere else for like a year or two. I wonder where they put it, like L.A. or, or Anaheim. Uh, no, the way the the way they're talking about doing the expansion is it would expand into what is the Embarcadero North Park area. So it's on the back side of the convention center currently. They'll build out on the back side of the building. So they'll still be able to operate through the rest of the facility while they're building the extension. Oh, I see. Mm. But where are you going to load? Like, where are they going to have, like, all the people who come in and uh, – because, like, we've got a booth, and last year they had us coming, like, if where if where you were talking about them expanding it is where I'm thinking, isn't that where all like the parking lot where they had everybody go to unload yeah. all their stuff? Yeah, that backside where the loading docks are. Yeah, they'll be building. Yes, they'll they'll probably so build the tunnel gonna... into the into the loading dock first, so that everybody can still drive into it. It's going to be insane if they if they get it passed, but you know they got to keep it running. Oh yeah, see there it goes. So, being the old pro at Comic Con, what would you uh, recommend I should do there? Are there like <laughs> must see? I guess it's different each year. What is what is the go to you know, when you go there? It, it really is different every year. I mean, obviously, there's the you know, see if you get in the hall H and all that kind of stuff, and and the panels are different every year. Um, honestly, the, the most fun I ever have is getting with a friend or two and just walking the, the floor with uh, all the boots and everything. Yeah. My, my general advice to newbies is, is spend your time on the show floor. Cause you can, yeah. you can lose so much valuable experience time standing in line, especially for, oh, hall yeah. H. like <laughs> I, I, I've honestly never actually tried to get into hall H just because it's, you'll literally be standing there the entire day and there's no guarantee you'll get in. Yeah. So, okay, you know, well, okay, you know, yeah, there's, there's, you know, the big things like, you know, the Marvel panels and all that. Uh, so you can hold out hope that you get into there or you can see all the, the minutia and, and everything that's in the vendor's room. And honestly, you might want to try leaving the convention center because the area outside has now become just chock full of uh, other events and games and uh, the, the whole city becomes like yeah. just one big well, like, party. <laughs> well, like for the last few years, Nerd HQ took over uh, the Children's Museum across the street. And this year, Sci-Fi is setting up over there. Oh, that's cool. So like all, oh, okay. Sci-Fi's got all sorts of stuff going on over at the Children's Museum. And then uh, parts of Petco Park become, you know, facility space and like uh, Nerdist is set up there and Geek and Sundry sets up stuff like in town. Oh yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to do. It's cool. So EJ, are you the oh, type yeah. of person? Do you dress up every year? <laughs> I want to so badly, but I'm there for work. And so I'm like, uh, okay, do I, do I get to cosplay? Do I get to like, you know, let my Trek flag fly and show up in Starfleet uniform or something? <laughs> uh, or do I like actually like look like a professional? And <laughs> You know, isn't that the one uh, place, though, where uh, they can kind of both fashion. melt? It's always a dilemma every year. <laughs> I really do think that's the one place where you can let it just kind of meld, though. You think so? Yeah. 
I, I, I'm always afraid to, to, to risk it, you know, because uh, especially, you know, when I started going, I was like 24, 25, you know, and worried whether or not people will take me seriously and all that kind of stuff. Ah, to hell with seriously. It's Comic-Con. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. There you go. <laughs> so you said that you guys have a booth this year. What are you guys doing at your booth? Ah, 1949. Yeah. Um, we're going to be, obviously, uh, talking about nobility and talking to folks about that. We're going to have uh, this fun bingo going uh, going on uh, where you'll be able to uh, uh, get prizes if you can find, if you can check off all the the you know find all the different things that are on the bingo so like okay if you go find you know a gender bent stan lee you know <laughs> somebody cosplaying as, as a gender bent stan lee you know okay well there's your marker you know or uh, a captain america or you know insert favorite cosplay there you know that kind of thing well i know one of our so friends is going prizes. one of our friends is going as a gender bent star lord so you should put that on your nice bed. <laughs> <laughs> we should we should <laughs> that'll be fun we'll definitely have to stop by um how did you get involved Please. in doing the the comic cons and everything you said you've been doing it for like oh. since 2012 yeah um well you know i grew up in the industry uh as, as a child actor and so uh when i started uh when i got out of college and started uh, uh, kind of getting back into the industry, um, I was working with some projects that had panels at San Diego and, and things like that and was able to use my uh, credits from uh, Child Actor, you know, like uh, Jingle All the Way or Four Meets or what have you, and to get a pro badge and just kind of kept going. You know? <laughs> and then, uh, then my, um, you know, nobility started getting... Uh, panels and, and we started having a booth there ooh three four years ago something like that oh wow um yeah i think it was 2014 i think is when we had um uh our first booth and panel there and uh yeah it just kind of kept going ever since now you mentioned jingle all the way like how young were you when you started acting ooh um it was shortly before i turned four so three years old uh is when uh, we got an agent and, or I got an agent. My, when I say we, like my mom got me an agent <laughs> um, and, uh, kind of started working right out of the gate. Um, wasn't long before I was SAG and yeah, the rest is history. So were you living in California already or where did you grow up? Well, I was born in New York, but, and my mom started the process of kind of getting me in the industry back then. Uh, but when I was like two, two and a half, uh, we moved back to California where my parents grew up. And yeah, uh, I grew up, uh, when I was doing Jingle Law, I think we were out in Highland, uh, out by San Bernardino. And then we moved to uh, Placentia, which is uh, in Orange County. What was that like being a kid actor? I mean, did you have any awareness of like how big some of the people were that you were working with or was it just like hey i get to play pretend i don't know who you are <laughs> um uh you know it was a fun way to grow up i had a, i had a lot of fun um you know you, you hear all those horror stories about the the crazy stage parents and all that and that's definitely out there and and, and i've seen that and it's very unfortunate i got lucky that my mom who was the main one who was was with us was not like that. It was always, you know, if I said stop, I didn't want to do it anymore. You know, she would have said, okay, you know, that's it. We're done. Now, of course, there was always the temper tantrums of, I don't want to run lines right now. (laughs) (laughs) You know, every kid's got that. Um, But yeah, I I just had a lot of fun. Um, And yeah, I was aware of of a lot of the actors, like uh, we keep coming back to to Jingle. um, And... Uh, you know, I, obviously I knew at the age of eight, I was eight and turned nine. Uh, I knew, uh, you know, who Arnold Schwarzenegger was and who Sinbad was. And, uh, I wasn't really aware of who Phil Hartman was, um, uh, on some of the other ones, but, uh, like uh, Rita Wilson, what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, but my mom told me, so I was like, oh, okay. So this is someone important. 
<laughs> you know? uh, of course, my mom had a lot of fun uh, on the jingle shoot because uh, uh, Robert Conrad from um, Wild Wild West, uh, you know, wait, the, the not obviously the Will Smith one, but the, what the, that was based off of. The good one? Uh, played the cop. <laughs> yeah, the good one. <laughs> I did say it. Uh, <laughs> uh, played the cop, and she, as a kid, had had a crush on him, so she was very happy. <laughs> but <laughs> what, was, well. what was one of your um, favorite memories of being a child actor? Like, what stands out for you in, in that, from that time? Oh, um, it's like, you know, Sophie's choice, cho- choosing your children. <laughs> uh, kill, kill the babies and pick one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to use the parlance of, uh, our, of our industry. Dell humor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, let's see, just try to tell you. Jingle story. Okay, okay. Um, so I don't know if uh, if you guys have seen Jingle or what have you. Um, I haven't seen it in scene... years. Back in the day, definitely. I'm sorry. Yeah, I haven't seen it in oh, years, cool. but I definitely saw it once upon a time. Okay, cool. Well, um, there's the that big parade scene at the end, and right before that, in the movie, you've got um, uh, Rita Wilson, uh, Phil Hartman, Jake Lloyd, and myself sitting. In, uh, in a car and we're like, oh, let's, let's go, you know, can we go to the parade and, and you'll park the car and we'll catch up. And they say, okay, go ahead. And we run out. Uh, of course, what parent would do that these days? I don't know. <laughs> 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 you would never find your kid again. But <laughs> it's a movie. Um, for some reason, I don't know if it was just they, they wanted a bunch of different angles or what. Um, it took forever to shoot that little bit. And so we're sitting there on the universal back lot, which by the way, um, I even back then was a huge sci-fi fan and back to the future fan that was shot on the clock tower, uh, lot and back to the future. You must have been um, psyched. <laughs> so you just, you, yeah, I was like, cool. Oh, yeah, back to the future. Uh, <laughs> Artie was right over there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so we're sitting in the, in this hot car in the middle of summer on the universal back lot in winter clothing, oh God. um, <laughs> for hours and hours and hours, just waiting there for, uh, for uh, us to be told, you know, or, or for them to set up the cameras and get the different angles in between takes and all that. And Phil Hartman being the, the, the consummate comedian that he was kept us all entertained by singing songs and telling jokes and all that crazy stuff. And there was this one song that I memorized from that point. Cause like, as a little kid, I thought it was hilarious. I don't know if you want to hear it, but yeah, yeah. Absolutely. bring it on. <laughs> okay. It's, it's very, you know, uh, grade school humor, but, uh, you make my butt shine. You make my butt shine. The more you kiss it, the more it shines. The clock is ticking, so keep on licking. Oh, how you make my buttocks shine. <laughs> <laughs> and that stuck with you. And Phil Hartman was singing that to you guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it was one of those moments where, like, in hindsight, you realize, like, hindsight? You know, especially not now that, that Phil's no longer with us. Um, just how like awesome that was at the time. Like I said, you know, Rita Wilson, Phil Harmon. Oh, these are just cool adults I'm hanging out with. Cool, you know. Right. <laughs> I didn't, you know, realize oh, it's Tom and Clive and and it's Phil freaking Hartman. Um, but anywho, uh, yeah, that was uh, that's that's one of the stories. That's amazing. And then there's the time that Arnold scared the crap out of me. Oh, tell us that one. <laughs> oh, you want me to tell that one? Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'd had it, you know, my, the, the, everyone uh, on set loved my mom because she just instinctually knew how to behave on set. You know, you don't bug the, the, the actors, you don't bug the crew, you don't try to buddy-buddy up. They talk to you, great, you know, they keep the conversation going, great, but don't force it. 
Um, and so I'd had that drilled into me, you know, even at that young age. And so um, Arnold had his little, you know, section with, you know, where he could watch the monitor or, you know, or sit down or what have you in between takes. And I was walking by that and okay, you know, there's Arnold. We've been working on this project for however many um, weeks or months at this point. So it's like, okay, there's Arnold. Uh, and so I just walked by and, you know, you know, as I was trying to do just okay, leave him alone. And he calls me over and he, he points to uh, one of his daughters. I'm not sure which one it was. Uh, but and he goes, this is my daughter. I'm like, oh, hi. And I, I don't think he meant it to come across this way, but here's this tiny eight-year-old kid, a big, bad Terminator. <laughs> and, he, and then he points to his daughter and goes, hug her. <laughs> oh, hug her. Don't hurt me. <laughs> so I kind of sheepishly give her a hug. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, yeah, that's that, that. It's something, oh, Arnold scared the crap out of me. Something about Arnold with, <laughs> with young kids. Like, even my nephews, I have, I have a bunch of nephews, and we were at lunch today, and we were sitting at the restaurant, and my seven year old nephew's kind of, or eight year old nephew's kind of futzing around and won't sit down in his chair. And I turn to him, like, sit down. <laughs> and he starts doing his Arnold impression back at me. I'm like, sit down and get to the chopper. <laughs> He's like, oh, get to the chopper. <laughs> Little eight year old. I mean, we're just having a ball doing Arnold Schwarzenegger sitting at lunch. <laughs> Kids love Arnold. So, okay, so you said that, you know, you were growing up, you were doing this. Um, what was that like as far as going to school and, like, did how did other kids that were not in the industry view that? Were they, like, amazed or did they even know? Was it a secret? Um, some of them knew. Um, but, uh, again, you know, coming back to, to you know, I'm, I was lucky to have – uh, the parents I did because they, they handled it right. It was okay. We were on set, and then on set you have school teachers there. Like by law, they have to have a teacher there to, to mm-hmm. tutor you for three hours a day and, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and and so you know, and you get pampered on set. Like I, I, I'm convinced that's part of the reason why so many child actors like kind of go nuts. So is because you're so incredibly spoiled on set. <laughs> um, and my parents' attitude was, okay, you know, that's fine. Let's enjoy it. Now we're back to the real world with chores and school and homework and all that. So I went to regular public school and all that. And um, sometimes there are some logistics difficulties, like, you know, uh, with, the, with the school and what have you, because, um, you know, they're pulling me out, pulling me back in for auditions and all that kind of stuff. But as far as the other kids, um, so, you know, a few folks knew or, or they'd find out because it wasn't something like we were hiding. It was just like, oh, yeah, I'm, I got to go to an audition. Oh, wait, you do acting? Yeah. You know, oh, that's cool. And, you know, they'd ask a few questions, what have you. And then they'd get to know me and, you know, okay, it's, you know, just like I was saying with, you know, how you see Arnold every day. Oh, it's okay. That's Arnold. Great. He's over there. You know, it kind of was like that. And every now and then some kid would come up. Oh, you know, you were in Boy Meets World. I love that show. Can I have an autograph? And Okay. You know, but that was, that was pretty rare, you know, you know, once or twice a year, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the most part, it was just a fact that people knew, you know, and, and they thought some of them thought it was cool and some of them didn't care and, some of them, you know, that's all they knew about me. So they're like, oh, cool. And, and it was a bit of a bigger deal with those folks. But no, yeah, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was, it was school. It was normal school. <laughs> yeah. you know? It's like, yes, you had a great time on set. Now go take out the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> now, as you transitioned out of being a child and started moving into adulthood, was it clear to you that you wanted to continue being in the industry or did you have to do some soul searching and come back to it? Um, a little bit of both, actually. Like I knew I never wanted to not be acting or not be in the industry. But at the same time, um, in fact, this is kind of what I wrote my college, uh, entrance essays or one of them about is it was kind of like I had, had two lives. I had the entertainment industry life and then I had my normal everyday life. And so 
I, I, I wanted to maintain the, the industry life, but at the same time, I had other interests, um, you know, uh, politics and, and writing and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so there was a bit of, like, I, in college, I, I went to uh, uh, George Washington University back east, and, you know, I, I worked on, on the 08 presidential campaign and, and interned uh, uh, with uh, um, Senator Feinstein and, and what have you. And so I, I explored those other things and then uh, decided that you know, politics isn't quite what I want to be doing because there's too much BS. <laughs> uh, and so I went. So Wait, I so you're saying the industry, industry is with, less BS? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I was going to say. So I decided to go into something with even more BS. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's the BS that you know, right? Like you grew up in that BS, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, swimming in it. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it was a, uh, quite, quite a stench every night, you know, coming home uh, covered in BS. But no. <laughs> uh, literal bull, you know, uh, scat. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm off the uh, as much as you want, sir. <laughs> this is Uh-oh, the internet. You're free. Dangerous. You're free to go. No censors here. <laughs> yes. Now, okay. So, um, was I? Uh, oh, so you were yeah, uh, um, doing politics in so, East Coast. Well, yeah. With, with the, with, what I realized, you know, I, I kind of um, looked around at at you know one of the jobs I had. Um, in, in uh, politics, and I realized like nobody was really happy. They were just kind of waiting until they were like they're totally getting dumped on and mistreated and what have you. And they were just kind of waiting until they were high up, high enough up on the food chain to dump on everyone else. So it's just a consistent pursuit of power. Yeah, and it was just like okay, you know, and, and I'd rather. If I'm going to have to put up with BS, I'd rather be doing something I enjoy, you know, Nicely while so. I put up with it. And then, <laughs> of course, every production, the amount of BS is determined by, uh, you know, the guy, the, the guys at the top. So I try to work with folks that aren't quite as full of it, <laughs> 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 you know. <laughs> so far, for the most part, been fairly successful. There's always the bad eggs, but you know, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about nobility. Um, uh, I just What's watched that? the <laughs> just watched the first three <laughs> episodes uh, before we started chatting. And uh, cool. can you tell our, our viewers a little bit about it and where they can see it? Sure. Well, you can see it on Amazon. It's uh, the basic concept is Firefly meets the Office with a Star Trek twist, uh, and the the premise is the. Pan human, the defunct pan human government is decided to show what they humanity what they have to offer by doing a documentary on their flagship, the CAS nobility. Not quite realizing that perhaps these aren't the people you want to be showing as the best you have to offer. <laughs> um, but like the tagline goes, while these aren't the heroes they were looking for, they might be the heroes that humanity needs. Uh, and like I say, you could find it on uh, Amazon and Amazon Prime right now. And you said you first had a booth for it as far back as 2014. Like, how long have you been yeah. working on this concept, and and what did it take to get it to get it produced and then up onto Amazon? Ooh, that's a story. <laughs> that's we what we're here stories. for. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I initially came up with the concept late 2012, and. Um, you know, I was working on another project and I, um, I, I, think, uh, I don't know if you guys are, are truckers or whatnot, but, um, I'm, I'm sure you know Will Wheaton. Oh yeah. And I remember hearing stories growing up about how he, he knew what each button on his console on the bridge of the enterprise did. Like he'd, he, he even if, if, uh, no one else knew he'd figured it out so that, you know, when they say engage, they say, I press this button to go to warp or, yep. you know, this button to fire weapons, that kind of, of course thing. he did. Yeah. <laughs> of course he did. 
Um, and so I was uh, acting in this project, and I was the navigator. So I was sitting at my console figuring, okay, this button's weapons, this button's this, this button's that. I was, I was doing the same thing. And uh, it just kind of hit me. Uh, modern family in space. Never been done before. Uh, and, you know, uh, and then I started and I came up with a few of the characters right off the bat and what have you. And it just slowly evolved into, you know, office, uh, Firefly the office. Uh, with the Star Trek quest, uh, as I started writing it and writing the series Bible and, and writing the first few scripts and what have you. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the origin story. Uh, as for getting it produced, um, you know, we, we did some crowdfunding. We, we uh, got some uh, other investors and put together a very, very small budget um, with which to shoot this thing. And uh, I don't know how, but we, <laughs> we pulled it off. Uh, and we start, and, and one thing I am really proud of is, is the cast we were able to assemble. Yeah. I wanted to ask uh, you about the cast of, for sure. Cause, cause it's a lot of, a lot of very recognizable faces from multiple different science fiction franchises. Yeah. I, I, I kind of had a lot of fun with, you know, who, who else can I get from, Insert series I am a major fan of here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the way that happened was we got a, we got a couple of the, of the cast on board, either uh, meeting them at, at conventions or uh, uh, you know mutual friends who put us in touch. And then we turned to them and said, "Okay, who would you like to work with?" And you know they said, "Well, you know this guy I." see at cons all the time i hear it'd be great to work with or i worked with this other you know person you know a while back and and they were fun to work with and so we just kind of started piecing the cast together that way and we ended up with gosh we got a uh, uh walter koenig from uh from star uh, trek the original star trek and babylon 5 we got doug jones from well now star trek discovery and hellboy and pretty much everything that you've ever seen he's in it well, I don't you're, care if it was before you're like the only person to cast him as himself <laughs> yeah everybody else wants him in weird suits and doing warped things with his potty <laughs> i was like hey well, look you say, can he, actually he, see the guy's face in this in this show <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know right it's like hey you know we we uh the, the advantage of not having enough money to turn him into an alien. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it really has been a, a, a little engine that could this project because you know we we had almost you know we, we had a laughable budget. We had uh, you know a lot of folks telling us we couldn't do it. A lot you know a lot of obstacles and. It's just been a lot of of grit and you know labor of love and pushing and begging and pleading and you know man my knees are sore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but uh, coming back to the cast, yeah, um, uh, Doug Jones, uh, Chris Judge from SG One, uh, Tori Higginson. Higginson from Atlantis, uh, from Atlantis and Dark Matter. Yeah. Uh, James Kyson from Heroes, uh, Ellen Dubin from Lex and, and Napoleon Dynamite. And I, I think she's doing Lego Star Wars now. <laughs> or was. Oh, Skyrim. She, she's done a lot of video games. Uh, so like Skyrim, uh, what have you. Fallout 4. Uh, the voice of uh, Optimus Prime is our computer, Neil Kaplan. Uh, he also did the voice, uh, you know, speaking of like insert franchise, I am a major fan of love Starcraft and I love Starcraft too. And he played Tychus Finley on that. Oh. And it was a few years ago, uh, we were on a panel with him and <laughs> he just launches into his Tychus Finley voice and goes, you know, hell, it's about time. I can't do it. Uh, but you know, <laughs> and I'm just on this panel going, yes, yes, in front of like 700 people, like I think it was at WonderCon, and I'm just like, yes, 
<laughs> I was nerding out in front of everyone. You know what? I'm sure the fans <laughs> love that you're a nerd too, though. They're like, oh, one of us. <laughs> One of us. One of us. <laughs> <laughs> like Toy Story, the little the claw. <laughs> the little alien. <laughs> um, the I... claw. <laughs> One of us. <laughs> EJ, so you you said that like this this idea just came to you while you were working on another show. Uh, had you been a writer previously? Had you ever thought that you were going to produce your own um, creation, or was this? Like, how did you even get into it as far as finding the characters? And are you the only writer or have you hired other writers since the inception of this? What's your process? Um, so, so far, I've, I've been the only writer. Um, I, 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 I love acting and I will never stop acting. But at the same time, I've never felt limited by acting. Like that was the only thing I do. And actually, in 2011, uh, I met uh, Richard Hatch at Star Trek Las Vegas. Um, and speaking of cosplaying, like that one was like it was my first Star Trek convention. I'd always wanted to go, but my parents were like, oh, that, that's what nerds do. You don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm a freaking nerd. My first Trek uh, convention anyway. was 2009, I believe. Ah, so we're, we're, we're not too far off. Yeah, and I met, I met Richard Hatch at, at, for my first time. At the Star Trek convention in Vegas. Oh, nice. Yeah. Richard Hatch he was a great guy, wasn't he? Out there. Oh, he was great. Such a great guy. Yeah. I, when, he, when he passed, I was, I was shocked and dismayed. Oh, I was devastated. Uh, I mean, he was, he, was, he was my hero when I was a kid on Battlestar Galactica. You know, like I just okay. adored him. So I got his signature hanging on the wall in my bedroom. Picture of him and um, the guy who played uh, Apollo in the in the new Battlestar Galactica picture of the two of them together in front of in front of a, a, a one of their ships um yeah it broke me broke me up to, that is awesome. to hear his passing it was, it was, yeah i you know it, it's um yeah it was just i had no idea he was even ill nobody did i think he he did a good job of keeping it under wraps and, yeah uh you know we we hung out a few times and 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 you know, I attended his acting classes uh, when I could, and, and yeah, it's definitely a, a talent will miss. Um, but uh, anywho, um, so I met Richard Hatch at uh, 2011, and I'd already kind of been been thinking like I, I I've always like I got my minor in creative writing. I've always been writing. Um, uh, ever since I was a little kid, I was doing stories and what have you, and and all that. And so I was thinking about kind of diversifying within the industry. And I met Richard Hatch and uh, it was 2011. So I think I'd, I was 21, 22, 23. And, you know, I said, you know, Hey, you know, I, I asked him for advice. So it's like, I'm, I'm going from, um, I'm going from, you know, child acting to adult acting. Um, you know, what would you recommend? And he basically said, uh, go produce your own stuff. Don't, don't, nobody these days can get away with wearing just one hat. You can't just, yeah. like it used to be, you get an agent, you know, you sit by a phone and wait for them to call, you know, and he said, you can't do that anymore. You've got to be a lot more proactive. Um, and so, you know, get some friends together and shoot some, something. Um, and so like, that's what I did. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, a few years later we were at, I think it was WonderCon and, uh, uh, the, the winter twins, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They're at like every convention, these, uh, uh, two, two gals who, who are twins who, uh, co-write um, their books, uh, and they were good friends with Richard Hatch. And so I was talking with them, and I and I told them the story I just told you. Oh, you should talk. You know, you, you should talk to Richard. He's uh, uh, he would love that story. Y- yada yada yada. And they ended up bringing Richard over to our nobility booth, <laughs> and I was like, Yeah, you know that. Not sure you remember that advice you gave me. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, and he had a big grin, and he uh, he gave me his number, and and like I said, you know, we we hung out and texted and talked every now and then, and uh, but yeah, until until he wasn't he couldn't text anymore. It's one of the things about the sci-fi community that I really love um, is everybody is so supportive of one another's endeavors. Um, so often when you when you go around talking. Somebody was told by somebody else, you know, oh, go make it. And if you need help, let me know. Um, you know, I, I just love that. It's like it's like that the geek community carries over into the production side uh, of this business, which I think is is wonderful. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I, I've seen the ugly side. I've seen uh, the side that you you you're just describing. But um, yeah, it's it's very much uh, it's very much community um, and. There's so, sometimes you know you'll see rivalries break out and all that, but for the most part, it's we all love this stuff. We all want to see more of it. That's uh, most of the folks I, I work with, or at least one you know writers, producers, what have you. Uh, they're creating it because they love it and want to see more of it. Mm-hmm. That was kind of part of why I, I created Nobility was because. Uh, at the time, everything was just dark and bleak, and you know, Battlestar Galactica, e the new one, and I loved the new Battlestar Galactica, but that's all that was out there was this post-apocalyptic stuff, and I just uh, was like, okay, I I want to do something different that's more, you know, about redemption and hope than you know, slip my wrist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, it's the it's the whole thing uh, going on with DC's films right now. You know, are they going to go the Wonder Woman route, which is, you know, hope and and uh, whatnot? Or are they going to continue down the BVS route and stay dark and depressing? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, I well, that. I mean, but what was it dark and depressing? Like, it started out dark and depressing. It was shot dark and depressing. But in the end, you know, Superman was good again, you know? mm so I don't know. Uh, I'm just throwing out different opinions. Um, <laughs> we probably shouldn't go too far know. down the BBS opinion route. We'll we'll have a whole nother episode sitting here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rabbit hole. <laughs> so when you're, but, um, yeah. oh, I was going to say when you're writing these episodes, what, where do you draw your inspiration from? Like, how do you get your ideas? Um, I sit on a couch and I think really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most honest answer um, we've ever had. Probably so. <laughs> um, I sit in the I car mean, and like, lightning like strikes said, my brain. <laughs> I'm sorry? I was just saying, I sit in the car and lightning it hits me in the brain, and I just suddenly am inspired. <laughs> okay. <Ta-da>! Uh, <laughs> I am idea man. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, like I said, like I, I, I grew up steeped in, uh, sci-fi. Like, you know, I'd come home from school. It wasn't, you know, what movie I was going to watch, you know, pop into the VHS. It was which Star Trek movie I was going to watch, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, which Star Wars movie was I going to watch? Mostly Star Trek. But which which Back to the Future am I going to catch today? Yeah. 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 I had exactly. all those same conundrums myself. <laughs> <laughs> you feel my pain, man. You can't be. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, sorry, my dog is going silly. Um, but, uh, so, you know, so there's a lot of stuff like, oh, well, if I ever did my own thing, I would have the spaceship do this. Or I really like this aspect of that, you know, maybe, you know, if I tweak it and, and, and what have you and, and integrate it, um, you know, so so there's some of that, and then there's also like I'm just talking with my friends, and we're we're just shooting the shit, and you know, all of a sudden, it'd be like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if Mooney Walter's character did this? Oh yeah, let's do it. You know? <laughs> um, and, and and then after that initial, you know, wherever that initial spark comes from, be it experience, be it that lightning in a bottle, be it you know. Uh, goofing off with friends, um, 
then it's, it's honestly, it's a lot of that. This, the real work is not just is refining it right. and just going over and over and making changes and, and rewriting and tweaking here and tweaking there and, and what have you. And then, and then seeing where there's holes like, okay, so, um, you know, Mooney and, and Sirius do, you know, this and they, and they do that and they do that. Well, okay. But then that means, you know, <laughs> this, <laughs> this has to be a certain way. And, you know, it's all piecing it together slowly, but surely. Right. So, and it all boils down to me sitting on the couch thinking really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> now there's currently three episodes up on Amazon. Uh, how many episodes are in the first season? Um, what, right now, what you, what you see is what we got. Oh, okay. Um, we've got, yeah, we got the, uh, the first three episodes, uh, out or we, we were able to shoot the first hour and now we're on the march towards trying to make more. Awesome. And is there a website that people can go to, to check out more information on the series? Uh, if you do another crowdfunding campaign, that sort of stuff, like where, where can they check that stuff out? Sure. Uh, nobilityseries.com. Also, you can catch us on facebook.com slash nobility series and at nobility series on Twitter. Awesome. Well, EJ, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us. Um, we'll definitely try and uh, swing by your booth at uh, comic con, uh, just for the people who are listening, who are going to be there. What booth number was that again? That was 1949 and, uh, looking forward to see you and maybe some of your listeners there. Fantastic. Yeah, that'll be great. All right. Well, best of luck awesome. to you, and uh, hopefully we can uh, shake hands in person with you here in just a, a, another few days or so. Sounds awesome. All right, EJ. Take care. All right. Bye. You too. Bye. bye. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck. Telling you, please... Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. Ears.